Good morning, dear saints, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today's Wednesday, August 7th, and you're listening to the program where, you know it, each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church, right here in Laverne, Minnesota. And today we're going to pick up where we left off from yesterday with Luke chapter 22, verse 55, and continue into chapter 23. After Jesus was arrested, Peter follows behind and ultimately denies knowing Jesus three times, fulfilling Jesus' prediction. Jesus is then mocked and beaten as he faces the council. Jesus stands before Pilate and Herod, facing false accusations and mockery, and despite finding no guilt in him, Pilate succumbs to the crowd's demands and sentences Jesus to be crucified. Jesus is then led to Golgotha, where where he is crucified along with two criminals. And as he endures the agony of the cross, Jesus asks for forgiveness for his executioners, and he promises paradise to the repentant thief. Thy Strong Word is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Visit them online at lhfmissions.org to learn more. Be sure to put an S on the end of that. And I'm thankful that you're here with us today, spending some time with us in God's Word. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can email me at thystrongword at kfuo.org. You can also find me on X at Pastor Boo or on Facebook. Let's get right to our guest because just like yesterday, we have a lot to cover. And joining us this morning, it's the Reverend Ben Dose. He's the pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Algona, Iowa, and St. John Lutheran Church in Burt, Iowa. You've been on the show a bunch of times. I'm happy to have you back. How has... uh? How's God been treating you out there in Iowa, brother? Uh, very well, very well. Uh, just uh, got into my new call, uh, was installed uh, June uh, 9th uh, here at Algona and Burt. And so uh, it's been been a real good uh, learning experience and uh, always learning something new every day. So it's uh, it's always always fun. So Now, is this your, this is a dual parish. So is this your first time ministering to a dual parish? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yep. This is my first time. Uh, I've done uh, a couple of vacancies uh, different right. times, but uh, this is my my first time doing a, a, a dual parish, and uh, we've got an associate with us here, too. So uh, it's a good, uh, good partnership arrangement here. So, yep. Absolutely. And they're, and they're definitely blessed to have such a, a, a faithful pastor as you, and I'm blessed to have you on the show again. Hey, listen. Enough with the with the <laughs> with the introductory. We have to got to get going. I think we have like another seventy verses to get through today. Oh Lord, help us! <laughs> but you know, if we don't make it, it's okay. I don't want to. I don't want to shortchange because this is a really important teaching. And despite yeah, that, sure. you know, a couple months ago when I divided this up, I didn't notice how much I had left for us to cover. <laughs> um, you know, we'll just go through it and we'll get what we need to get done. So go ahead and start us with a word of prayer. And we'll jump right in where we left off from yesterday. All right. Gracious Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for giving us your word to read. Uh, We thank you for allowing us to see uh, what it is that Jesus went through for the forgiveness of our sins, uh, especially now as we look at uh, Peter uh, denying Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, being mocked, and also uh, his... uh, um, uh, before uh, his uh, trials, before uh, Pontius Pilate and, and Herod as well, uh, and also the crucifixion. Uh, there's so much to cover and so much to do. Uh, we thank you for this wonderful uh, portion of Scripture that we get to see what Jesus did for us. Uh, it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Opening my Bible, I'm finding my place. Here we are, Luke chapter 22. I'm going to begin with verse 54. Then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately 
while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. That's the end of verse 62. I got to tell you, Pastor, as I read this, it, it, I've read it a bunch of times. It affects me the same way. But I got to tell you, what kills me every time is verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. See, it's not just that he knew that his, he was sinning uh, and remembered Jesus' words, but the Lord saw him. And, you know, the Lord continues to see us, too, as we struggle with sins. And so, you know, we should weep bitterly over our sins. I mean, we know we're forgiven. He, Peter's in the process of being forgiven for this sin just as he commits it. But, you know, being upset over sin is not a bad thing. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. You know, uh, being upset over sin is is definitely what uh, what gets to us, uh, as we know with uh, confession. You know, there's two parts of confession: one that we repent of our sins, but also the second that we receive the forgiveness that Jesus gives. And so, uh, being uh, sorry for our sins and and knowing that Jesus uh, did all of this uh, for us, uh, it definitely uh, cuts to the heart uh, as as Peter would say in his sermon uh, to those who were listening at Pentecost, uh, you know, uh, Jesus, you killed this Jesus, you crucified this Jesus. And so uh, definitely it uh, cuts to the heart. And so uh, being sorry for our sins, as Peter, I'm sure, was was very sorry uh, for his sins when Jesus looked at him here uh, in verse uh, 61, uh, definitely a good thing that we are, uh, sorry for our sins because it uh, it reminds us and and it it tells us that uh, we definitely have kind of a uh, knowing knowing right right and wrong and and when we're confronted with our sins with the law it it definitely definitely cuts to our heart there so for sure it's it's good that we are are sorry for those sins for sure yeah and you know and we've seen so much public and egregious sin which frankly is not new to the world. But what seems to be kind of new is this, I don't know, this pride that some people take in being hardened to sin, right? I, it doesn't bother me. I'm, I, I expect it. I, I don't know that that's the flex people think it is. I, I, I lament over not only my own sins, but the sin of the whole world, because that's, that's what drove Jesus to what we're going to talk about today. And, but what's fascinating about this particular text, too, though, is that he still chooses Peter. Knowing in advance of this betrayal, using that word lightly, this denial, that's the better word. Knowing in advance this denial, he still has previously in our last chapter told Peter that he would be the one to comfort and encourage the brothers. So, you know, we we always preach from what we know, don't we? And we're sinners. And so when yeah. we get get the privilege to preach to sinners, then uh, then we're really preaching just to ourselves, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, for sure. Anything else from this text, though? Let's let's. I want to make sure that we don't shortchange mm-hmm. anything else before we move on, though. I mean, I know there's a ton, but anything mm-hmm. real big? Um, well, it's it just uh, uh, you know, there's definitely some people that were. It looks like uh, with uh, Jesus uh, or around Jesus uh, when he was uh, uh, arrested uh, in the garden, and it looks like uh, some of the people are with uh, Peter here as he is uh, standing and warming himself by the fire. And so uh, it would seem that uh, these people would uh, kind of travel uh, to and fro uh, with with Jesus and, and just kind of uh, seeing what was happening here. So, uh, and so, you know, uh, the people are saying, well, Peter, you've been with Jesus. And, and obviously the denial itself is Peter saying, no, I am not with him or I was not with him. And so uh, it's definitely one of those things where where Peter is, uh, you know, uh, outright denying uh, knowing Jesus or, or being with him. And so, uh, you know, how many times, uh, you know, haven't we in, in our in our sin uh, been able to, you know, say the same thing? You know, a lot of people, a lot of people not, uh, you know, I would say a lot of people see this text and say, well, you know, if I was Peter, I would have done better, or I would have, you know, uh, I would have stick up for Jesus, you know, when uh, when he was, 
you know, being questioned like this, but uh, uh, in all reality, it's definitely something that uh, we probably wouldn't have done any better. And uh, we look at our own lives and say, oh, you know, well, I had this opportunity to share Jesus or, or talk about Jesus with, with somebody else, and I didn't because I was fearful or I was, uh, you know, didn't want to be in an uncomfortable situation or whatever. And, and obviously Peter here is, is in an uncomfortable situation, and so he denies uh, knowing Jesus. And so, um, well, we, we look at our lives and we say, well, I, I probably wouldn't what, probably wouldn't have done anything different either. So, And that's where that uh, forgiveness comes in that uh, you talked about and what Jesus talked about too, so— well, you know, and sin is irrational. We know sin is irrational, yeah. but but I, it makes me wonder, though, what was Peter afraid of? Like, why was he denying Jesus? And yeah. in the moment, of course, he is worried about something that I think most Christians struggle with. He's worried about what other people think. Like, yeah. we could say, and it would have some validity to it, that Peter was worried about them turning him over and them arresting him, too. But, you know, as we look back, if we take a step back, they only came for Jesus. They didn't come to arrest all the disciples around him, which was kind of their MO and perhaps would eventually something they would want to do. We do know that the disciples would end up being martyred anyway. But but I wonder if Peter's fear here is less that, well, they might catch me, but more about he just doesn't want to be associated with Jesus. Now, if that's not the struggle of an American Christian, I don't know, because now that the world has not progressed, but regressed to a time when Christ is no longer welcome and his message is mocked, that Christians don't want to be standing by the fire and have people go, hey, this guy's a Christian, and then they act like they're not. And I think that is certainly one way in which it can connect to us today. Oh, yeah, absolutely, for sure. Yep, we can definitely see a lot of similarities uh, between uh, Luke 23 and and, uh, Luke 22, I should should say, excuse me, uh, Luke 22, and also today as well. So for sure, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of similarities there. So, well, let's let's get closer and closer to the text you were actually assigned, 23. <laughs> but we're going to have to do one more little section. Here we go with verse 63. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept striking, uh, kept asking him, "Prophesy, who is it that struck you?" And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it from ourselves, from his own lips. All right, so they're trying to entrap Jesus, right? It, it's not as though they, they, if he said, Yes, I'm God, they're going to be like, Oh, we were wondering, you know, welcome, thanks for coming. No, they wanted him to say yes so they could persecute him. They eventually got what they wanted. Um, But, yeah, take us through this. They're saying, saying, hey, Jesus, are you the Christ? Just tell us. We just just tell us the truth. Yeah, it's interesting here uh, that uh, in verse 64, uh, they also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, uh, who is it that struck you? Uh, It's interesting, too, that uh, uh, just a couple of verses before, uh, we see that the prophecy that Jesus made about Peter was true. (laughs) And what happened to Peter actually did happen. Uh, Such a contrast that, uh, you know, in verse 64, that uh, we see the we see those who are uh, striking Jesus say, ah, prophesy, who is it that struck you? You know, and so... <laughs> and You're so right, anyway, I, never, uh, I never put that together. You're absolutely right. I mean, I mean, obviously, we know Jesus is the prophet of all prophets, God himself, but, but he just got done prophesying, at least as the narrative goes, and here they are yeah. mocking him as if he couldn't yeah. do it. But he chooses, right. he chooses not to do it. He really chooses not to give them what they want, and that is to incriminate himself, even though, of course, he ends up doing that because they're going to take anything he says as incrimination. Um, Do you see significance then in the phrase, you say that I am? 
because I, before you answer, and and I, I I think we are so we have such the luxury to spend deep time in the Bible. I often think that we make a lot of associations and connections, which I don't know. May, may, maybe we're just being too creative. Oftentimes, this I am is used to provoke or to evoke the name of God. Um, and sometimes I think just Jesus does it intentionally. Actually, I don't agree that he always does it intentionally. Sometimes I think it's just the language. What do you think about this section? Do you think that I am here is intentional? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I kind of look at it. It's, it's kind of part of a bigger phrase. And so I'm thinking it's kind of maybe unintentional here, <laughs> but I think it's, uh, Jesus kind of, uh, uh, using the, the words of the, um, the captors, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. kind of against them, I guess, is kind of what I kind of see it as, you know, uh, definitely I, I know that, uh, those two little words, I am, uh, carry so much weight, you know, especially in John's gospel. Um, but uh, here in, in Luke's gospel, I'm not real sure. I, I sure. would kind of maybe take it more as, um, you know, just kind of uh, Jesus is kind of repeating uh, what uh, those who had him uh, were saying. And so uh, I would I would kind of be maybe, <laughs> maybe a little cautious or maybe just concerned. kind of say, well, I think it's just kind of kind of just more just repeating what, what they said. So. So when they say, what further testimony do we need? We've heard it ourselves from his own lips. That's <laughs> yeah. their own interpretation of when he says, well, you're, you're the one who's saying that I am. And they're like, yep, that's it. That's enough. That's all we need. Exactly. It's, it, exactly. It's, it's so funny. We, we, uh, we talk about this, too. You know, we have heard it from his own lips. Well, sort of. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, it, right. It's, more, it's, more, it's more from their own, and yeah, like you said, own interpretation. And so, you know, it's kind of a kind of a runaround thing, you know, it just uh, makes you, makes you kind of chuckle a little bit, but uh, uh, in a, you know, in a, in a holy way, I guess, if you want to say it that way, but uh, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I like to say it, it's, it's cosmically funny, right? Like if you step yeah, you back go. and you're just yeah. like, yeah, this is just in the grand scheme of things, it's facetious, but isn't it also, dare I say, politics, right? I mean, words are twisted. Yeah. Uh, statements are taken mm-hmm. out of context. Uh, you know, little mm-hmm. sound bites and jabs and and make no mistake, folks at home, that's what's going on on the ground here, too. This wasn't really a religious trial. They didn't really want to know if he was the son of God. They were concerned about their political and earthly power. And Jesus, whom I think some actually knew to be the Christ, but rather their positions in the world was greater, greater than accepting Jesus who had come and the Messiah. But let's let's keep on reading. Verse 20, uh, sorry, chapter 23, finally, verse 1. <laughs> then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. Now when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. Okay, pausing there at the end of 7. They take him before Pilate. They say, you know what? You know who would be a good person to take this guy off our hands? The <laughs> government. So they take him to the Romans. And the accusations really kind of uh, betray them, don't they? I mean, th- they're, they're making him out to be a political usurper rather than a religious figure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, and, and I guess, uh, you know, as far as, what the what the the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders are doing there is kind of taking the path of least resistance a little bit, you know, as far as uh, let's just hand him over to Pilate, you know, because uh, you know that that'll that'll take care of everything, you know, that they'll just kind of speed up the process, you know, and and uh, you know they want to kind of put it on on Pilate's shoulders uh, rather than their own and that sort of thing. And so uh, definitely, you know, there's so much going on here as we just talked about too, with the government and, and it's not just so much a, 
uh, a religious thing going on here, but obviously in these verses, uh, one, two, three, uh, we can definitely see that there's a lot of government stuff <laughs> uh, being uh, taken taken place here too. So, uh, you know, the thing that uh, I see here uh, so much of is uh, in verses uh, two and three, uh, as far as, uh, you know, we have these titles uh, for Jesus, you know, um, uh, as far as, uh, um, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Uh, and then, you know, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, you have said so. And so anyway, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, different names and, and titles uh, for Jesus that are happening here that uh, uh, really um, kind of have some, some weight in some sense. Uh, they kind of have some weight as far as uh, who who Jesus says he is and and uh, who the people think he is and who Pilate says he is and and so anyway it gets a maybe a little confusing but it also has a lot of weight to you know basically uh, speeding up the process of the trial too so well in the same way that the Sanhedrin or the council here kind of passed the buck to mm-hmm. Pilate. As soon as Pilate hears king of the Jews or asks him about being the king of the Jews, I think what Pilate means by king of the Jews is absolutely different than what we know it to be and what Jesus understands it to be. He thinks of Pilate, right? The the guy who's yeah. been kind of put in charge of the Jews. It's it's almost like a, a Native American reservation if you wanted an example in in American culture. You know, they had some autonomy but they were still well within the empire of Rome. So he says, oh, king of the Jews, huh? Oh, you're from Galilee, huh? Well, mm. let's send you over to Pilate. Yeah. Let's make you his problem. That's what yeah. happens starting in verse 8. Let's pick it up there. Sure. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with one another. Pilate then called together the chief priest and the rulers of the people. Let's not go into that just yet. We'll pause there at end of 13. Sure. Well, isn't that nice? Herod and Pilate become friends. I, I think it's funny that Luke <laughs> includes that detail because they yeah. would have been at enmity with each other. I mean, Pilate was sure. sent to this area, if I if I understand my history, because mm-hmm. he ruled with a heavy hand. And yeah. at the same time, though, there were so many, so many, uh, uh, what do you call riots and um, other problems going on in Jerusalem. Pilate was kind of Caesar's answer to. I'm going to send this guy in. Pilate's going to take care of it. He's a no-nonsense guy, which then makes sense why when the Jews brought Jesus to Pilate, they were pointing out things like he causes divisions and he's teaching people not to uh, not to uh, give to Caesar. And, oh, and by the way, he thinks he's a king. And But Herod and Pilate would have had the same sort of political animosity, but nothing like a common enemy to bring you together. And so these two governing officials become friends over their persecution of Jesus. Strange bedfellows. But regardless, uh, Herod should have known better, but it sounds to me, brother, like Herod, well, wasn't much, he might have been king of the Jews in name, but he didn't seem to have much interest in the Jews and their faith in Messiah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd be uh, totally correct, exactly. And, you know, definitely as we see in Luke's gospel from the beginning of Jesus' life, uh, you know, we talk about Herod, and, and Herod is kind of a, a name for ruler or king, uh, uh, much like a pharaoh or governor or president or something like that. And so uh, when we see this uh, Herod here, uh, we know it's a different Herod than than was ruling at the time of, of the birth of Jesus. But, you know, the Herod that was ruling at the time of the birth of Jesus uh, definitely was like, oh, you know, who who is this guy, this king of the Jews? He's going to take my throne. He's going to take over, you know, my my position. And, and so, uh, yeah, he, he didn't have a clue, uh, really, <laughs> who Jesus was or uh, what Jesus was uh, supposed to do. Uh, he didn't have probably a lot of, uh, uh, you know, literature. He didn't know the literature of, of the 
uh, of the Old Testament, uh, you know, books. And, uh, you know, he had to uh, kind of, uh, you know, ascertain from, from his uh, his own officials and things where Jesus was to be born and that sort of thing. And so anyway, uh, you know, he didn't, yeah, he didn't, uh, uh, he was kind of, like you said, uh, the king of the Jews in name or the ruler of the Jews in, in name only and not so much, you uh, uh, not so much, uh, you know, just kind of with the people, but, uh, you know, kind of he had the name and uh, the, I don't know if you would call it popularity, but the uh, authority or power, I guess. And, uh, you know, definitely, uh, definitely didn't understand, you know, who Jesus was, uh, you know, because it says here he was hoping to see some sign done by him. And so uh, he kind of maybe looked at Jesus as kind of a, a circus act or, or some kind of oddity, you know, uh, you wanted to see some kind of uh, miracle uh, done by Jesus, um, which we know too, that there were many miracle workers at the time of Jesus, um, you know, different uh, people that did uh, different things by uh, different powers, but, you know, obviously Jesus did his miracles by, by the power of God. And so anyway, uh, you know, he, he definitely didn't, uh, didn't get who Jesus was. Mm hmm. Yeah, it, and it's fascinating, too, because we have Herod the Great, um, who obviously sought to kill Jesus, and this is Herod Antipas, which is the son of Herod the Great. So, yeah, you have this legacy of tetrarchs. A tetrarch is, like I was saying earlier, it's sort of a division, obviously in fours, but a division, a Roman sort of principality kind of thing, and he was given a rulership over it. So it's interesting to see even how this whole family has been at enmity with the Christ. And that's mostly because they, yeah, they sought worldly power. Uh, Herod the Great, the first Herod that we encounter in the timeline of Jesus, he had one of his own sons killed in fear that he was going to take the throne from him. So Herod yeah. Antipas is not much different, but we definitely see more of a, I don't know, just kind of a, he wants Jesus to come and perform for him. It's not, again, just like the Jews in the council, they aren't there to discern if, Jesus is really who he says he is. They have already decided that he's not. But Herod is very interested in seeing some of these miracles that he's been hearing about, whether sincerely or just uh, to be entertained. I tend to think it's that latter. But I'll tell you what, yeah. we're going to have to go to break now. We're right up against it. But when we come back, well, we're going to go back to the, uh, the House of Pilate and see what's happening with Jesus. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo, and with me today it's the Reverend Ben Dose, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Algona, Iowa, and St. John Lutheran Church in Burt, Iowa. Once again, find me on X at Pastor Boo or on Facebook, but probably the best way to reach out is by email at thystrongword at kfuo.org. Don't forget, though, if you send a message while the show's going on and it's related to what we're talking about, I'll do my best to get that question or comment out on the air. Okay, let's head right back to it. Now we're back in chapter 23, verse 13 again. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me, brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. 
Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted, and he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, and for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. That's the end of verse 25. You know, Pilate's in a tough position here. And you know what? And I have to kind of admit I've always been a little sympathetic toward Pilate. I, I, I've never seen him as the villain in the story. Um, I don't know. What, what do you see, Pilate, kind of you know, the machinations of his, of his mind here? I mean, he's kind of got a no-win. They want him to release someone that creates insurrections, but he's there to keep the peace. He wants to release Jesus because even though he's not a believer, he doesn't believe that Jesus did anything wrong either. But then he also is being pressured by the crowds who he also needs to prevent from causing a riot in Jerusalem during the Passover. Um, so like I said, I'm a little sympathetic to Pilate. I think he's in a tough position for a non-believing ruler. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we definitely see that uh, pre- uh, a lot of uh, pressure is being put on Pilate from a <laughs> different side. Uh, and, and not only uh, the people that are uh, wanting Jesus uh, to be crucified, uh, but we also have uh, pressure from the Roman government as well, making sure that uh, Pilate is there to, as you said, uh, keep the peace with an iron fist in a sense. And so he's getting you know pressure from the Roman government to keep uh, everything at bay, but also he's getting pressure from the people uh, to you know have Jesus uh, crucified. And so, yeah, we can definitely see that, uh, and we can definitely see that Pilate is under a lot of pressure here. And I didn't quite um, see this myself until, well, I, you know, watching the movie The Passion of the Christ, um, and that's a whole other issue, I guess. But uh, mm-hmm. it's just it's a, a good uh, artistic uh, representation, as with yeah, all things that all things that are done with art. Uh, we have, uh, you know. Uh, the artist's depiction of, of what happens. And, and so you can say, well, you know, maybe it wasn't exactly uh, the way it was. But anyway, I, I could see in the movie, at least, you know, with uh, kind of what we say, filling in the gaps here uh, with Pilot, that, you know, he was just, you know, under a lot of pressure on both sides. And so uh, definitely we could, we could be, you know, I guess, yeah, like you said, a little sympathetic to, you know, what's going on and, and, yeah, I mean, not um, I, yeah. to interject. Yeah. Not everybody is. Not everybody agrees with me. But I, I yeah. just like I mm-hmm. said, you know, and w- there's another mm-hmm. area too. Don't forget, Luke doesn't mention it, but his wife, his wife is like, let this guy go. I had a bad dream because yeah. of him, mm-hmm. and, you know. Mm-hmm. And whether that's whether that's the Lord giving her that dream or what, I don't think we'll ever know. But but the sure. point is, sure. um, God's will is done though, regardless. And of course, we confess right. to this day that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. So I'm not yeah. letting Pontius Pilate off the hook. He still mm-hmm. was willing to beat Jesus, even thinking he's innocent. So that's certainly not commendable. Um, and at the same time, he does eventually give in to the crowds. But but they're demanding that he be crucified. Now, I, I hate, and I know it's bad form to kind of treat other texts when you're in this one, but I do want to bring in the concept of um, one of the reasons why they said they wanted the Romans to crucify him is because they claimed they had no law by which they could condemn him to death, which wasn't exactly mm-hmm. true from what I understand, but perhaps the timing of the Passover was getting in the way. Yeah, I could I could see that for sure, right, mm-hmm. uh, as far as... Uh, the Passover and the day of preparation and, and all those sorts of things for sure that, uh, you know, uh, the religious uh, rules and laws that affected what was happening uh, outside of, you know, Pontius Pilate or outside of uh, uh, these uh, you know, proceedings, I guess is what I'm trying to say, uh, definitely probably had some, some weight there for the uh, uh, for the Jews, but also for Pilate and, and uh, you know, uh, definitely... Uh, 
affected the way that they did things. There's uh, some irony, right, in the name of Barabbas with mm-hmm. what that means? Yes, so Bar- right. Yeah, so Barabbas means what? Son of the Father, if I'm if my Hebrew's right? Yes, correct. Yeah, Bar, Abbas, right. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, exactly. So <laughs> uh, so definitely, uh, you know, Jesus was, was really the Father's son, right? You know, Jesus right. was really Barabbas, but, you know, there was a prisoner whose name was Barabbas. And so uh, what, a, what an irony there. Yeah, what a, oh, <laughs> what a, what a play on words. And, and uh, you yeah, know, definitely we see throughout the Bible, uh, you know, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, but I think probably more, a little bit more in the Old Testament, you know, this, this huge uh, play on words and, and that sort of thing. So um, I, I'm not saying this is a play on words, but uh, I'm just, uh, it's just kind of interesting here, the, the irony of, of Barabbas. So, yep. Yeah, and you see more irony and stuff like that in John. I think you even mentioned that earlier. You know, and and you you're right. And I want to make it very clear for listeners at home. So when we talk about the authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Paul, or anybody else, and we say that oh, they're they're using symbolism or they're using um, irony or it's humor even, um, it isn't to say that they aren't accurately reporting it. But like in this case, did we need to know the name of the guy they released? Well, no. But Luke includes it, and I believe because his real name was ironic, and so he includes it. So it's not that he's making up the name to be ironic, but rather he's giving us the details that deliver a particular message. And in this case, yeah, that great irony. So you got to love the writers and, of course, the Holy Spirit for that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, let's go into the next section because this Simon of Cyrene has always been a very interesting character in my mind. Verse 26. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? All right, that's the end of 31. So obviously two different things here. The first briefly mentioned is Simon of Cyrene. Now this guy's interesting. You know, he... he, (laughs) <laughs> Simon had to come from Cyrene. That's in North Africa. This guy just kind of like came in. I, I don't know. The way I picture it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor, mm-hmm. is Simon shows up and why he's there, we don't know. There's some speculation that he might be a believer later or something like that. But it just seems like they pick him out of the crowd. I mean, what if this guy was just like walking home from getting some groceries and now suddenly he's carrying a cross? <laughs> what a crazy situation. I, I mean, if we really think about it, yeah, I mean, you're just standing there and some Roman centurion or a soldier grabs you by the neck and says, hey, carry this cross for this dangerous criminal. Uh, it's just yeah. a wild scene. It, it is. It is. And and we really don't know. Like you said, I mean, there's speculation as to why he's there, but there's really no known reason why Simon from Cyrene uh, was there. And so uh, – you know, we kind of talk about uh, throughout the Bible that God picks the most unlikely people to bring about his cause or plan of salvation. Well, um, you know, Jesus, it, it from reading the text, it looks like he was in such a weakened state uh, that he could not uh, carry his own cross. And so uh, this Simon of Cyrene, uh, for uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, was picked to, to help Jesus uh, carry the cross. And so, um, yeah, it, it, like you said, it's just a wild scene and, uh, yes. we just don't quite, <laughs> we don't quite understand why or how he was there, but he was. And, and so, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, I guess once again, going back to the birth of Jesus in, in Luke chapter two, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, liken Simon of Cyrene to the donkey, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that carried uh, uh, Jesus and his, his family from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem. But, uh, you know, uh, God used God used Simon of Cyrene to, you know, carry the cross 
uh, for for Jesus uh, to get it to uh, get it to Golgotha. So, Mark tells us a teeny bit more. He mentions that uh, Simon of Cyrene was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Scholars say, well, he only mentioned those people. It makes sense that, well, people reading Mark would have known who they were. So that, I think that's where we get the connection that he could be at the very least father of some believers. Um, sure. And then Romans 16, you know, another Rufus is mentioned. Maybe that's the same guy. But I think regardless of this, you'll see people who want to imitate this or mimic that. You'll you, you probably hear about the guys who grab a cross and try to walk it across the country down the interstate or something like that. And <laughs> there's lot, lots of people who practice piety that involves carrying giant crosses. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, during this time, though, really, they'd just be carrying the top beam, right? I mean, the, the, the post would have already been established in the ground because crucifixions were like the yeah. worst, most horrible form of punishment. But the Romans did it a lot, and they were really good at it. So I think it would have been just that cross beam. Not that it matters for our faith, but just something I'll throw yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, I guess kind of once again, you know, going back to the, the passion of the Christ, you know, why Jesus had the full cross and why the the criminals on his right and his left about, you know, why did they only have the cross? Beam? I'm not sure exactly. So, um, yeah, so whether it was the cross beam or it was the full cross, uh, you know, definitely we, we're not quite sure, but, uh, um, you know, he helped carry something, <laughs> something that was very, very heavy for uh, for Jesus. So, Well, we just got an email from a listener, Kathleen, and she says, I just can't help but think that Simon is there for a reason that has not been made known to us at this time. I don't believe God does things by accident. Yeah. Yes, uh, Kathleen, I agree with you, um, and I actually agree with you, especially of we don't know why. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes when we say, well, we don't know why and we're just moving on, it's not to, to say that it's unimportant, but it's just to really kind of admit defeat. A lot of time has passed between these events, and I think probably Luke's audience would have been a lot more in tune with what was trying to be communicated here. But either, but either way, you're absolutely right. I, I definitely think that Simon is there. It's not just happen chance. And that if it wasn't significant, Luke probably wouldn't have mentioned it at all. So, yeah, I agree with that. What do you think, Pastor? Yeah, for sure. Yep, that was a, a very good, very good uh, comment and, and question from from our listener there. And so, yeah, thanks, yeah absolutely. Yep. Well, let's good. move on to the two criminals. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I'm sorry. We we I don't want to skip over daughters of Jerusalem. Yeah, don't weep yeah. for me. Um, yeah. This so. is this 70 A.D. Well, that's probably what we're looking at. I think a lot of uh, a lot of uh, scholars and a lot of uh, teachers uh, see in verses uh, 28 through 31 that would be, you know, probably the 70 AD, the uh, destruction of Jerusalem. So that's what uh, that's what I'm going to go with too. So <laughs> um, I think that's probably probably what we're looking at here. So. Yeah, and, and remember, folks, 70 A.D. is when Jerusalem was eventually destroyed. And But this also this visual of Jerusalem being destroyed absolutely points forward to Judgment Day, although I don't yeah. know that Jesus is specifically talking about Judgment Day. But uh, but it's, it's proleptic in the sense that Jerusalem Falls is a localized macro example of what it looks like for judgment to come upon the world, and one day it will be all of us. Verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, Well, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, 
Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, there we go. Obviously, we're being told that baptism doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, I I, I say that, of course, jokingly, folks at home. This is so often the thief on the cross is raised up to try to deny God's gifts in baptism. And and you don't have to go into that, but it's just I, I think it's such an unfortunate such an unfortunate situation where I think the meaning of this passage, all the beauty, all the grace has been overshadowed by people misusing this to try to defend not baptizing their children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely. It's a text that just is so loaded with uh, good news and it's so loaded with uh, uh, forgiveness. Uh, you know, uh, just kind of going back just a little bit to verse 34, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus uh, is being just uh, completely railed on the cross. Uh, he's getting, um, you know, uh, He's, he's getting beaten, and, uh, you know, obviously he's hanging on the cross. And uh, anyway, <clears throat> even in his last words, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so even at the end of his life, after all the suffering and all the pain and all the things that he's going through, uh, here he's still uh, speaking words of forgiveness, and and that's that's who Jesus is, and that's what Jesus has, has come to do. Uh, with regards to you know the the two uh, thieves uh, and the one thief on the cross uh, who asks for this uh, forgiveness, uh, just simply saying, "Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom." Um, you know, I, I guess I kind of like to say, "Well, you know, if if Jesus uh, had met him earlier, he probably would have been baptized," or or you know. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, as far as the, well, you can be saved without baptism. Well, uh, okay, yeah. you can be saved without baptism, but uh, we put our faith in baptism because uh, Jesus uh, gave it to us uh, to use it for our good. It's a good, godly gift that he gives to us uh, for his grace. And so um, I would like to say that, you know, um, this you know, thief on the cross, uh you know, uh, probably given a little more time, probably would have been baptized. But, but the the word is the word is sufficient, and uh, uh, the word is is Jesus saying, uh, "Truly, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise." And so, uh, you know, that's where that's where our trust lies is is in that word, and and what is part of baptism, but the water and the word together, and so. Uh, yeah, just just trusting trusting in that word of Jesus uh, to the thief on the cross. Um, you know, that's the the grace and the good news that we have here. Exactly. The b- baptism obviously gets its power from being combined with the word of God's promise, and so you know that's what we go to baptism for because God tells us this is the means by which I want you to make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. In this case, mm-hmm. and I've heard it said, and I mean I don't know that it's definitive argument, but. There's also no evidence that this man had not been baptized. I mean, just because I mean, the assumption is that as soon as they're baptized, they wouldn't go on to be a thief. Well, that, that we know that that's not true. So <laughs> it could have been baptized, maybe connected. Maybe that's why he knew of Jesus uh, more than yeah. this other guy. Um, but then also, you know, God is a God who can do what he wants, but we su- certainly shouldn't put him to the test, hoping that he'll just make exceptions. So, you know, if you really want to be saved without being baptized, then I guess go hang on the cross next to Jesus. But thankfully, that's not something that God calls any of us to do. Hmm. So uh, let's keep on going. 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts, and all of his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. That's the end of verse 49. 
We are seven verses short of finishing the chapter, but that's where we're going to have to stop. We'll pick up the rest tomorrow. But uh, yeah, take us through this last section. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have here, you know, the darkness that is covering uh, the land, it says here, the whole land, uh, whether that's the whole earth, I'm not sure for sure. But uh, anyway, it definitely says the whole land. So let's just you know, kind of keep it <laughs> at the place where, where Jesus was. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the curtain of the temple uh, being torn in two, uh, very thick uh, temple curtain, uh, very, very thick, very rough. Um, having that torn in two is a huge kind of uh, 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 thing that happened that, you know, basically God said now uh, uh, the Holy of Holies is is open uh, to all people because of uh, Jesus' uh, death here, um, uh, because of what happened here in the cross. Uh, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Um, uh, that's just, you know, something that uh, Jesus uh, finally, uh, you know, said it's finished, uh, even though uh, – even though he's not saying it's finished in those words, he's still saying, uh, God, I, I, Father, uh, uh, my spirit is, is now with you, or uh, in, into your hands I commit my spirit. And so, um, uh, anyway, uh, and then we have the, the centurion uh, seeing this, uh, praise God, certainly this man was innocent, uh, knowing that Jesus was, uh, you know, an innocent man, uh, and so... Uh, all kinds of all kinds of things are happening here uh, at the death of Jesus, and so uh, we we know from the text, and, and we know from other places that when Jesus died, it was uh, the payment for all sins of all time, and so uh, that's the uh, the good news that we have uh, for for us today. Even though it's uh, it's heavy with the the death of Jesus, uh, but still there is the forgiveness of sins that uh, we have because of it. You know, and that centurion, you know, here we have someone who is not only involved directly in the crucifixion of Jesus, but he's not a Jew. He's a he's a Gentile. He's not a believer. And yet at this witness, he believes he believes he says surely he was the son of God. He's even talking in the ways that Jews would uh, not one of the gods, as most pagans would have said. And so, yet again, more proof that faith comes by God, right? Certainly this man was innocent, but uh, elsewhere we have him saying certainly he was the Son of God in another text. So, yeah, just this beautiful testimony from the Gentiles. It foreshadows that Jesus died for all people, not just the Jews, but even for those who were actively taking his life. What a blessing because of Jesus we don't have to worry about pleasing God by keeping the law perfectly because he's done that for us. And so I appreciate you sharing the good word with us today. I'd like to thank my guest, the Reverend Bendos, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Algona, Iowa, St. John Lutheran Church in Burt, Iowa. Those two churches have an excellent new pastor. Thank you, brother, for being on the show. Oh, thank you so much, Pastor Boo. All right, folks, tomorrow we're going to keep on going. We'll catch up and then we'll actually finish the book. We're going to finish Luke, and then we're going to move right into 1 Thessalonians, and then 2 Thessalonians after that. So lots of good stuff coming up. I will see you when you come back. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong name.